to me, the BRICS is a huge major impact. For, for starters, I think gold only got the 2500 because central banks became major buyers and they became major buyers because they recognize what's happening on the world stage. And they also recognize that gold is going to play a major role in the new way that many countries throughout the world are going to trade. I'll say it again. I believe that, and I said this a year ago, so I said the three to five years from there, when the bricks are all said and done, what they will have done to world commerce will rival what the industrial revolution did to world commerce and gold's going to be a significant part of it so it's it, it it's when you have such a move that we've had in the price it's okay to consolidate there's nothing wrong with that gold prices experienced a modest pullback on wednesday dropping over 0.70% as the us dollar regained strength following comments from federal reserve chair jerome powell the gold dollar pair settled at $2,504, retreating from its daily high of $2,529. This movement comes amid a complex backdrop of central bank policy shifts and geopolitical developments. Peter Grandich, founder of Peter Grandich & Company and a respected voice in precious metals investing, views the current market dynamics as a healthy consolidation phase for gold. Grandich anticipates potential support of around $2,350 and resistance of nearly $2,600 suggesting room for further price action. The recent price fluctuations follow Powell's speech at Jackson Hole, indicating the Fed's readiness to begin easing monetary policy. Typically, such dovish signals from the Fed would be expected to weaken the dollar and boost gold prices. However, the precious metals market is also being influenced by broader global economic shifts, particularly involving the BRICS nations. Grandich believes the financial impact of BRICS could rival the Industrial Revolution, with gold playing a pivotal role in this transformation. The upcoming BRICS summit is a significant event for gold markets. These nations, already major buyers of gold, are expected to discuss critical economic and geopolitical issues that could challenge the U.S. dollar's global dominance. Such a shift could further support gold prices in the long term. Recent data underscore the BRICS nation's growing influence in the gold market. China's central bank reported gold holdings of 2,264 tons at the end of June 2023, marking an 18-month streak of increases and a 16.3% rise since November 2022. Please tune in for our exploration of Peter Grandich's expert analysis. Don't miss out on future content. Hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications to stay in the loop. We appreciate your support. So when we hit our target about a week or so ago, I talked about a much needed and desirable. Mm -hmm. Although markets a lot of times don't do what we think is best for them, Ronnie, but I felt a, a corrective consolidation phase now for several weeks in the gold market. It may be a worst case scenario of 2350. There's tremendous support at that level and trading to the highs, you know, approaching 2600 would be really healthy going into the BRIC meetings. As you know, and I don't want to sidestep, but it's important. To me, the BRICS is a huge, major impact. For, for, for starters, I think gold only got the 2500 because central banks became major buyers and they became major buyers because they recognize what's happening on the world stage. And they also recognize that gold is going to play a major role in the new way that many countries throughout the world are going to trade. I'll say it again. I believe that, and I said this a year ago, so I said the three to five years from there, when the bricks are all said and done, what they will have done to world commerce will rival what the industrial revolution did to world commerce. And gold's going to be a significant part of it. So it's, it, it, it's when you have such a move that we've had in the price, it's okay to consolidate. There's nothing wrong with that. The majors are now going to be in their second quarter where they're looking at $2,500 gold and a total cost hundreds of dollars below that. So the free cash flow that this is going to generate, even if we just sit here, forget about going higher, is really going to make the major stronger and stronger. And that will filter down to emerging producers and the junior resource market. So let's go back a couple of years, Ronnie. This is important. The Bank of International Settlements in a sense, the clearinghouse for central banks, the central bank's central bank, made a change a few years back and upgraded gold to a tier one investment to join bonds. Why they do that? Well, at that same time, dozens 
of countries began a repatriation of their gold from the United States back to their country. Why? Then on top of that, record amounts of purchasing of central banks. So remember, not too many years ago, 15 or so, they were big sellers of gold. They're not doing this for a trade, Ronnie. They're not speculating. They're doing it because they foresee the change that is coming. The handwriting is on the wall to them. And on top of that, Ron, gold has now outperformed bonds. Ron, I, I'm, I'm in my fifth <laughs> decade of being in the financial service industry. I remember from my first day in 84, a sales manager would say, yeah, the stock market is somewhat risky, but if you want safety, you put your people in the bond market. Well, gold has outperformed that. And so it's not a surprise that A, we've seen that. It's not a surprise that we've seen the hedge funds recognizing that. And remind you, this is still not something that are that's on the average investor's mind. You know that I'm part of a major planning group here that we deal with U.S. clients and businesses. Still, Ronnie, not one out of 10 people that come in with to show us a portfolio have any real representation towards gold, especially yeah. physical bullion. A couple may have a couple mining stocks. And so we still have a long ways to go in the cycle of ownership. And you were very thorough in your question. All right, central banks were buyers. Now the hedge funds are coming to buy. The next thing will be the major institutions and you know big players. And then finally, when the public shows up and the public starts talking about some junior resource stock when you're getting your hair cut or getting in an Uber car, maybe then we're sellers, but not before. The United States national debt has been climbing steadily for nearly three decades, reaching unprecedented heights. As of the writing of this article, the debt stands at $35.26 trillion, which equates to approximately $104,000 per U.S. citizen. In contrast, the U.S. federal tax revenue is around $5 trillion or about $14,929 per citizen. Financial expert Peter Grandich highlights the colossal U.S. national debt as one of the country's most significant challenges. With a debt of around $35 trillion and yearly deficits now measured in trillions, he argues that it's improbable this debt will ever be fully repaid. While these deficits may temporarily prop up the stock market, they threaten the nation's economic stability in the long term. In 2024, the debt-to-GDP ratio has surged to 122%, with the national debt continuing to rise. Critics argue that the Biden administration's spending policies, including substantial financial aid to Ukraine and investments in green energy projects, exacerbate the problem. These expenditures, they contend, do little to address the core economic issues and instead contribute to an unsustainable fiscal trajectory. Let's get back to the interview. There are a lot of life and death things happening. So there's five key ones for me, and I'll just name them. And if you want to discuss any of them, that's fine, Ronnie. The first and the biggest and remains is the deficit and debt. I just don't think people understand what $35 trillion is. And to, to, there's not even a chance that there could ever be a major principal payment back of that, let alone see it paid back. But the problem now is we're getting multi-trillion dollar yearly deficits. Mm -hmm. Listen, in four years, the debt increased by $11 trillion. Now, that helped the stock market because there's money swashing around and all. But eventually, if you keep putting on too much weight, you get sick from the weight. And that's where we're at now. So the biggest concern is, are we going to be able to make interest payments when the Congressional Budget Office, who's now up, to, up their target to $54 trillion by 2034, the debt, and in their forecast, Ron, they don't have any major recession in it. So if there's a recession or two within those period, the debt's going to come up higher or become more abundant faster. So how do you pay interest on that when 65% of the public is working paycheck to paycheck? Ed, Ron, you have something. What? So think of this, Ronnie, at $50 trillion and a 5% interest rate, which is not a lot, because eventually you have to refinance this debt. You can't pay it off. So you have to keep borrowing, in a sense, a Ponzi scheme to pay the old debt. That's $2.5 trillion in an interest expense. Mm -hmm. Ron, our best year ever as a government was $5 trillion, $300 billion in income. So let's just say that gets gets up to six trillion. Almost half of the interest is that is going to go to pay the interest expense. <laughs> so how does the government operate on the remaining part? It can't. So one thing is for certain: 
taxes are going to go up a lot and the ability to service and provide the services that government has been producing. And here's what really drives people when I, when I speak to them, they're so shocked. I said, remember now, you may either, if I'm talking to seniors, you're expecting your Medicare coverage, you're expecting your social security check. Hey folks, that's not in that number. They still have to come up with pay those services. They have to borrow for that to do it. Yeah. It's not sitting in a bank somewhere where they pull it and all. Then Ronnie, let's throw this out before we even get to the other four. You got state debt. Think about the people in yeah. California. How are they going to balance that budget? I can't wait to see that trick. Then you have corporate debt. And then you have consumer debt, which just continues to rise. Do you know the bottom half of earners in the United States right now? Almost 50% of them now are using credit cards just to pay for food, just to pay for rent, just to pay for gas. That's basically one out of five people right now. Talk to anybody that runs a food bank. They'll tell you they tripled or quadrupled the number of people showing up and the people of earnings of income have increased dramatically or showing up. We haven't even got to number two, which is a retirement and, and uh, aging crisis. Number three, the immigration issue. Number four, the BRICS, which we briefly discussed. And number five, and that's probably the most important one to discuss, Ron, because this is where everybody's going to turn to when one or more of these problems become acute and apparent to everybody. Political paralysis in our country right now. Mm -hmm. The Democrats and Republicans, and I don't care which one you are, they can't even go in a room together right now. Mm -hmm. And the division that is between them now is as bad as it probably was going into our civil war. And what's compounding that issue is each party has a fragmentation happening for the Democrats. They're moving more left. And for the Republicans, there's a segment that's moving more right. And political paralysis at a time when eventually they're going to have to deal with them. Because all people are going to do is turn to government and say, you got to fix this, whether you suffered because of the debt pressures whether you're retirement, you can't retire, you can't get good housing, the immigration, which no one wants to talk about. Because remember, every day, more and more people are coming in. And all those people coming in, Ronnie, the vast majority coming just with their clothes on their back. So for quite a while, they're going to be a liability. I'm not talking about them becoming voters for Democrats. I'm not talking about terrorists. I'm not talking about crime. The simple fact is the masses of those people, many who are coming just for a better life from where they left, are a liability. They're not an asset. As markets navigate these complex dynamics, from Fed policy shifts to changing global economic orders, gold's role as both a safe haven asset and a potential cornerstone of a new financial system comes into sharp focus. Investors and analysts will closely watch how these factors interact to shape gold's trajectory in the coming months. Share your perspective in the comment section. If the video resonates with you, join our community by subscribing to our channel and enabling notifications with the bell icon. Thank you for being a part of our community.